Welcome to Spectrum of Innovation. My name is Jesse Bobby, and this is Spectrum of Innovation, your trusted news and information source for Riverside County. This is our sixth episode, and we hope you'll be able to stay with us for the entire show. This complete episode, as well as individual segments, will be available on our website, spectrumofinnovation.org. If you've missed any of our previous shows and segments, you can also find them there on our website. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post weekly updates from our SOI training crew. And we will keep you in the loop on Riverside County's current happenings. A little, a little fun for this live show. <laughs> How's the weather out there? <laughs> so, we're gonna show you a few cool videos today about education and we have a lot on today's program. Right now we're having just a little bit of difficulties with the scripts. So we're gonna figure it out. We got our IT people working on that and we're gonna get this show rolling. So this is what a live show is all about and we're learning. <laughs> so this is gonna be a lot of fun. We'll have some great information to give you as soon as we get it up there. <laughs> I hope everyone's having a good day. We're working on it, we're working on it. We're gonna get the words up here soon. <laughs> it's the words that are right after this one. So whatever words are right after this, uh, they must be in a different color, I think. If you go to edit text, you'll find them there. So, I believe you're going to roll a segment. On March 22nd, Chaparral High School held their annual Spirit Games, bringing together the critical life skills and bridge programs. Led by Chaparral's ASB and Impact Peer Buddy Club, the future Pumas got a chance to hang out with football players, cheerleaders, and their high school big brothers and sisters. The purpose of this event is so that way we can bring students for, that are going to be our future Pumas to come and interact with students who are here on campus, and it gives them the opportunity to interact with the special needs student population and to interact with their typical peers that are here on campus as well. So we create a family environment environment to help them feel more comfortable about coming to the high school. So today is the Puma Spirit Games and uh, the fun part about the Puma Spirit Games and especially with ASB and all the ASB students that get to end up working this event is they get to end up seeing the fun and joy that comes with uh, bringing our community together. Why is it important for the younger kids to come on campus? It's important so that way when they get ready to come here, it's not as scary. I think sometimes when you start hearing about going to high school, there's a lot of things that you may hear, but when you get to come to the high school and experience it, and you can see the positive side of everything that's going on. Not only did the students meet with football players, cheerleaders, and peer leaders, but they also got the chance to play a game and have their names announced on the field. 
Nate Francisco. After their spirit games, the student participants received a lunch and enjoyed more time with their peer buddies. So, uh, what are you guys doing here today? Um, we're we're out here having a picnic with our friends. We we're having hot dogs and chips. Inspired by a glimpse into the future, these special students are ready to be called a Puma. What a great experience for all involved. It's just the right kind of peer support that we need to see in our schools, and it's great to see schools maximizing the potential of those that live with special needs. Now it's time for the Need to Know segment of SOI, where we share information that impacts Riverside County. Every year, the security company SafeWise uses FBI crime statistics and census population data that shows the safest cities in California. The evaluation is based on the number of reported violent crimes in each city. And this year, three Riverside County cities came out in the top 20. They are Marietta, Eastvale, Eastvale, and Temecula. When you look at their stats, you can see why they are ranked so high, especially when you compare them to Los Angeles, one of the lowest ranked cities. And why are they so safe? According to the Urban Institute, there's less crime in a city that's economically vibrant because it attracts people who bring resources that benefit everyone. And indeed, these cities have higher than average household incomes and thriving businesses. City leaders also credit the professionalism of the police departments. The fact that many police officers live in these cities and a large percentage of the military residents. What I find interesting is that although these cities' violent crime rates are low, their property crime rates are a bit higher, but still less than the state average. But Riverside County as a whole is doing better when it comes to property crime. According to statistics, incidents of property crime in the county fell by 1.5%, which is good news, but of course we should all take steps to avoid being victimized. Here are some tips. We all lock our doors, but be sure to secure all points of entry. Sometimes we forget about gates and windows, but unfortunately, the bad guys won't forget, so be sure to secure them. If you buy a new TV, don't just throw the box on the curb for pickup. Thieves can read too, and they'll see that a brand new 75-inch television now lives at your house. Instead, Break up those boxes and put them in closed trash bins. Finally, trim the bushes in your yard so criminals don't have a place to hide. Although small bushes in front of windows deter thieves from trying to access them. For more about our safe Riverside County cities and keeping safe, go to our website where we've posted links to all the information we shared in this segment. The Temecula Valley is full of innovative ideas, and it continues to develop. We find that education is one of the most important and influential subjects. What better way to support the education system than by attending Temecula Education Foundation's signature event, Taste of Temecula Valley. In today's Spotlight of the Week, we're going to fill you in on how it all began and what it's really all about. Taste of Temecula Valley is an event that's been held every year since 2011 in Temecula. It was all started by the Temecula Education Foundation, an organization that helps raise funds for schools to enhance educational opportunities in the arts and sciences. Why is there a need for a nonprofit like TEF to raise money for arts and sciences in education? Basically, it was designed because of the budget cuts. Uh, the state of California has been s experiencing some serious budget cuts in education, and uh, we thought that uh, an opportunity to offset some of those cuts, especially arts, science, music, would make a difference. What is Taste of Temecula Valley, and what inspired Temecula Education Foundation to create it? It really is an, an event 
that happened way back in the late 80s, and it was called Taste of Temecula. And they gathered wineries and some restaurants together, and they raised funds to help build up the supplies and things that needed to be in the Ronald Reagan Sports Park and the CRC. How has Taste of Temecula positively impacted Temecula education? The number one thing is it raises money. It's our biggest fundraiser of the year. We raise the money that goes back to the teachers in the form of grants. Taste of Temecula Valley is always held in Old Town in front of City Hall. The first event featured about 20 vendors consisting of one winery, one brewer, and a handful of restaurants. One of those vendors was Nothing Bunt Cakes, who participated in Taste of Temecula since the beginning. So what were some of your first thoughts when you heard about the event? Um, the first year I did run out because I could not believe the volume of people that did attend this event. But uh, once I did that first year, I was ready for the second, third, and fourth, and fifth. And actually the last two years, I was the number one vendor to raise the most money, outdoing even Pechanga casinos. It's been eight years since the first Taste of Temecula event, and it sure has grown. Last year, 60 vendors participated and about 1,500 people came out on the first night alone. Attendance swelled to 4,000 people the following day. Why does Taste of Temecula Valley continue to be such a popular event? I, th I think it's because of the variety. It brings the whole community together. We have teachers, we have students, we have you know the entire community invited to, to attend. We have people coming from Orange County, San Diego. Uh, we've had people come as far as Texas to, to attend our event. One of the big things about our event is the Friday evening. Friday evening is a VIP dinner. At the VIP dinner, we have 14 chefs from Pachanga come out and do our event and cater the entire thing. It is the only event where Pachanga comes off property to do an event. What can people expect this year? Amazing restaurants. We've got the best assortment that I think we've had in years and, and I mean best assortment by variety. Um, we have different unique foods that uh, they can't find everywhere else. Yes, yeah, some of them are restaurants here locally, but then some are caterers. In fact, one of our most unique is uh, Hashigana's Cuisine. The food is from West Africa. The flavors are amazing. There's a lot to look forward to with Taste of Temecula, but we can't forget the end result. Funding for more visual and performing arts and science curriculum in the classroom. If you're interested in having some fun at Taste of Temecula this year, get your tickets soon. You can find the links on our website. Do you remember that Whitney Houston song? I believe that children are a future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Well, in Riverside County, almost 80% of our students graduate high school. But what happens to those who drop out before they obtain their diplomas? Almost half of these students don't even finish ninth grade. High school dropouts face a lifetime of challenges, one of them being the inability to find gainful employment. Fortunately, there is help out there and a chance for lives to be transformed. SOI's head writer, Johanna Lack, will bring us more. Well, the current Riverside County unemployment rate is just under 4%. Joblessness among those without a high school degree is at almost 6%. Dropouts are also more likely to face poverty, incarceration, and other issues. The Riverside County's Workforce Development Board aims to change all that through the county's Youth Opportunity Centers located in Lake Elsinore, Hemet, and Ribido. Our uh, young people that come to us uh, just need to know that they're supported in life. Uh, they're looking for uh, guidance, maybe towards uh, a career. So we're able to help them to look at different uh, career avenues, such as um, the medical scribe program, construction, logistics, a water technology. Many times, young people that have had difficulties in education, they need the support and they also need uh, to feel that they're trusted and that they have an opportunity to be a part of the many things that we offer through California Family Life Center's Youth Opportunity Centers. California Family Life Center has also partnered with Eastern Municipal Water District 
and the county's Workforce Investment Board to offer the Youth Ecology Corps program. This program provides short-term job opportunities to young adults who are interested in exploring career opportunities in the water industry and related fields. So the Youth Ecology Corps program, we started it back in 2013 as a way to allow young adults to come in and get real world work experience here and the working one-on-one -on -one with staff and staff would be a mentor to them. While they're here, they're learning all types of skills. A lot of the youth come into this program that have no work experience and we found that to be a major obstacle, especially in the hiring process. We also have them go through what is called a professional development program. This helps them with interviewing skills, also helps them write resumes, um, networking opportunities, and just a lot of skills that the youth are really lacking when they come in to interview here at Eastern Municipal Water District. I get out of the program um public speaking, learning to deal with people. So far I've learned probably Excel the most. I never, I actually didn't know how to use Excel and they actually taught me how to do it. Uh, Outlook, which is more, it's like an email, but for a more professional setting. Here in the youth ecology program, I'm learning lots of professional skills, um, a lot about the water district and uh, everything that really goes into it, such as uh, solar, panels and um, just energy, the process of filtering the water, the filtration system and stuff like that. California Family Life Center's Medical Scribe program has been very successful in helping young people find work in the Temecula area. Classes are offered on site at the youth centers and graduates from the program are now working in medical offices. California Family Life Center's Intergenerational Mentoring Project is also very successful. The program's young people work on art projects with senior citizens at Lake Elsinore Senior Center. First hand is the communication and mindful communication that they're being trained for with senior citizens. The other thing is job skills. They may be working with perhaps older people or seniors that are in the community in a job related um, position. I, I like being a part of the program because uh, as growing up, I never had any mentors, and, and uh, this, I feel, gives the incentive uh, to uh, give the young ones an encouragement to pursue further experiences for themselves. Well, coming here, since I'm very antisocial, it helped me open up to new things and to meet new people and just like be out there, you know, have fun experiencing new things. Youth Opportunity Center programs provide the academic and workforce development that help many young people find better job prospects, a goal that's achievable with everyone working together. It is so crucial to provide guidance and opportunities for our youth in hopes that they will obtain a stronger future. We are so glad to see all these people making a difference. Do you know someone who might want to get connected? Check out our website where we will provide the links for you. Now it's time for the Hack of the Week, where we share useful tips that make life easier. SOI team member Jarek Benuya is here with a unique craft that turns a yarn into a budget-friendly yet very cool lampshade. Hello everyone, welcome to Hack of the Week. My name is Jarek Benuya and I'm going to show you how to make a lampshade with some yarn and a balloon. I know it sounds crazy, but you won't believe how great it turns out. You need a bowl, white glue, spray paint, cotton yarn, scissors, balloon, and gloves in case you don't want your hands to get messy. Now, pour the glue into the bowl. For the lamp size we're making, you'll need about two cups. Now take your yarn and put it into the glue. Make sure the glue covers all the yarn. By the way, you want to make sure the yarn you use is cotton. The other kind of yarn has too much fuzz and won't work as well. Of course, any color you choose will work. I personally like blue, so that's what I'm going to use here. Now take the yarn and wrap it around the balloon like this. You see I've been careful to leave space on top and bottom and let it dry for two days once you finish. I have one right here that I made a couple of days ago. And all I need to do now is to pop the balloon. Take it out. Like this. 
the opening we have on top and the bottom allows you to thread a lamp into it. Also, you can choose any spray paint color that you want to use. And there you have it. This is an excellent and easy project when you want a lampshade on a budget. I'm Jake Benuya, and this has been Hack of the Week. Wow, thank you, Jarek. That is a bright idea. Be sure to let us know if you try out this hack by sending us a comment through our website. We would really enjoy hearing about your experience or even seeing some photos. On to our show's Voice of Innovation segment where we highlight things that inform and inspire us. Did you know that March is Cerebral Palsy Awareness Month? There is a lot to know about this disorder, and members of our SOI team are here to give us an overview. Hi, my name is Karina Corona, and I have cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a collection of disorders caused by abnormal brain development or damage to the brain around time of birth or at an earlier stage of life. The causes of cerebral palsy can come from bleeding in the brain, infection in the brain, including meningitis or encephalitis, seizures at birth or in the first month of development and certain genetic conditions. However, in some cases, the causes are undetermined. Cerebral palsy is a permanent condition that affects one in 323 children in the U.S., making it the most common motor disability in childhood. Problems that occur with CP are trouble with communication, motor skills, mobility, and in some types of CP, trouble with seizures and learning. Not all CP disorders are the same. There are four types of CP. Spastic is the most common and it involves limited mobility and stiff and tight muscles. Dyskinetic involves involuntary movement or slow movement. Atactic is the least common type and it involves struggling with speech, trouble with grasping objects and bringing hands together and mixed involves symptoms from all types of CP. There's a lot I'd like you to understand about CP. That is why I asked my SOI team members to help me out in explaining this. Cerebral palsy doesn't necessarily mean learning disabilities. People with CP often have an equal or better IQ than everyone else. Most people with CP have a similar life expectancy to everyone else. CP can affect all limbs or just some of them. People with cerebral palsy can lead completely independent lives. Many kids with cerebral palsy can, will, and should go to mainstream schools. Cerebral palsy doesn't necessarily improve or worsen on its own. One child every hour is diagnosed with CP. Three in four people experience recurring pain as a result of cerebral palsy. You'll see many competitors with cerebral palsy in the Paralympics. CP affects about 17 million people, equivalent to everyone in the Netherlands. Every case of cerebral palsy is as unique as the person who has it. Thank you team, I appreciate the help on sharing facts about CP. There are programs such as the United Cerebral Palsy of the Inland Empire that have created programs that give children with CP a chance to grow skills such as socialization, independence, communication, safety, and health. I feel that one thing people should realize is that individuals with CP don't want sympathy. They want to be treated with respect like everyone else. Thank you, Karina and the team. That was just what we needed to hear. At JDS, we see every day how equal yet unique we all are. Just different bodies from the same earth. Check out the links on our website if you want to learn more about cerebral palsy. Now it's time for our In the Know segment to ensure that you're up to date on Riverside County's current happenings. Spring has begun. On March 20th, it began as a matter of fact. Happy spring! How does that saying go? 
April, bring me flowers, May, go take a shower? I don't know, something like that. I guess that gives us a little insight on the weather we might expect in April, which according to long range forecasts will be a mixture of rain and sun, but not the rain that we've seen in the past few months. So it's perfect weather to explore the flower super bloom, which is still going strong. And since we are on the topic of flowers, you might be wondering what's, what this blooming right now in the super bloom. It includes golden poppies, baby blue eyes, yellow fiddle necks, and daisies, which all germinated from last month's rain. You can definitely expect more to spring up in the days to come. Speaking of the super bloom, over 15,000 visitors stopped to take selfies among the poppies at Lake Elsinore's Walker Canyon, which caused caused quite a traffic jam and now on the weekends people must park in designated areas and take a ten dollar shuttle ride to see the flowers. Pechanga has donated a hundred thousand dollars to the to grant the city for use of additional resources and for the super bloom area protection. Hopefully with all this assistance the traffic will flow better in the area. The rains have also brought sinkholes and a large one appealed, appeared on Gilman Springs Road between Moreno Valley and San Jacinto. Rainwater had flowed into a squirrel den causing a cavern under the eastbound lane. Fortunately, repairs were made yesterday and the road is open for traffic. Further north, crews will be busy as usual with the I-15 Express Lanes project, and you can expect intermittent lane reductions between Warwick Road and the 60. Which brings us to a tip from us at SOI. Trucks can have multiple blind spots. Please be hyper aware while you're out on the road driving. Keep an eye out and drive safely, everyone. Are you looking for a challenge? The Supreme Soldier Triathlon Challenge might suffice your interests. This race will take place in Marietta and will include a series of running, biking, and swimming. Sounds tough. Best of luck to you, soldier. Here's an opportunity to see the longest running American musical in Broadway history. Chicago will be showing at the Fox Performing Arts Theater in Riverside. You do not want to miss this spectacular, so get your tickets and all that jazz. Let's go back in time and see Pink Floyd. A Pink Floyd affair, that is. This Los Angeles-based tribute band will be performing at Temecula's Boiler Room, where they will take you on a musical and visual journey through the land of the 70s. And it's 21 and older, so prepare to bring your ID with you before you time travel. We hope you've been hearing all of the hype coming from our studio about DigiFest Temecula. But if you haven't, listen to this. JDS Creative Academy is putting on its third annual DigiFest Temecula, a three-day digital expo event. There will be industry professional speakers, live music, game trucks, festival screenings, all concluded by an awards banquet. April is the month of innovation. In light of this, Riverside County is recognizing events themed with innovation, and DigiFest is actually one of them. So is the Future of Work event hosted by the Economic Development Coalition on April 18th. Einstein said, We cannot solve a problem by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created it. We encourage you to get out and get involved, or even inspired by other creative thinkers. April is also Autism Awareness Month, and there is a lot going on for that too. On April 2nd at 7 p.m., the community is invited to take the steps of Temecula City Hall and watch as City Hall becomes illuminated in blue light. Temecula will also host the Mayor's Inclusive Workforce Luncheon on Tuesday, April 23rd at the Temecula Conference Center. All of these exciting events that I just shared with you will be posted on our website, spectrumofinnovation.org. If you're interested in attending DigiFest, you can go to the DigiFest website, digifesttemecula.org. 
That way you'll be in the know too. And that is all for Spectrum of Innovation today. Thank you so much for hanging out with us through our technical difficulties. We will be back for our seventh live episode on April 25th. And you can see all of our updates and additional footage on our website, spectrumofinnovation.org. Or take a visit to our YouTube and Facebook pages, where we also stream weekly updates from our SOI training crew. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're there. From all of us here that work so hard at Spectrum of Innovation, we wish you a fantastic and wonderful April. Till next time, SOI out.